How's it going, everybody? Uh, a little bit of a bare table compared to the last few times. Actually, I'm going to take this off since nobody's right next to me. Uh, so today on the Headwater Science Center live stream, we are going to be going over a very specific group of dinosaurs. Before we get to that, we are open seven days a week. Six of them were open 9.30 to 5, and on Sunday, we're open 1 to 5. And this month, we're hoping to start an event uh, on the 29th of October. So there are limited spots for this, but if you want to hit that email at, at the bottom there, and when you're registering for spots, uh, if you have two kids coming to paint two dinosaurs, register for two spots. If you only got one kid coming, register for one. Or if you yourself, not just a kid, want to come paint a dinosaur, feel free. There's no age restriction at all on this. And the dinosaur is going to be a bit of a surprise. But now we got that out of the way. So we're talking about a type of dinosaur that I'm sure all of you are more than just a little bit passing familiar with, which is the Ceratopsians. It's not drawn up on the board. Uh, James and I did not uh, feel confident enough to draw that one. <laughs> um, but it is the same family of dinosaurs Triceratops was a part of. And they are generally called the horn-faced dinosaurs. That is what Ceratopsians mean. Now, they were some pretty big herbivores in a lot of ways, uh, not just size. Uh, they lived from the late Jurassic to the end of the Cretaceous when dinosaurs went extinct. They were herbivorous. They were in the group of dinosaurs we call bird hip dinosaurs, Ornithischia. And they ranged in size, actually, more than people expect. The smallest one was only three feet long, and that was little Psittacosaurus. He's kind of the oddball of the family, you'll notice. Doesn't have any horns, doesn't have a frill, but still a member of the family. And they all tended to have that very prominent beak. Which, let me get out of the way of the Pachyrhinosaurus there. So they all had this beak. And another kind of cool thing about them is they all had these very odd and unique horn setups. Triceratops is probably the best known because it was probably one of the largest ones known at the time. And it had a pretty iconic look with the two horns above the eyes, one coming off the nose, and a relatively simple frill. Although that was not the case for all of them. Uh, stuff like Ineosaurus, you can see, had this very sharp hook with the angle of his curve and had these horns coming off the back, a lot of little things, and a relatively bare front of a frill. Pachyrhinosaurus actually just had a big old flat, what we call a boss, on the nose. Two little hooks going out sideways on the top of the frill. Other than that, just little bumps and stuff. And Nasodocus, Nasodoceratops? Nasodoceratops. Nasodoceratops, thank you. Had these two very cow-like horns above the eyes but nothing on the nose and not a whole lot on the frill. And actually, it kind of wider little spikes. The other kind of cool thing about Ceratopsians is they are one of the groups of dinosaurs that we do know, at least some of them had feathers. Psittacosaurus had large quill projections, which are very primitive feathers, on at least the tail. And there's a theory that Pachyrhinosaurus, which lived up in what is now Northern Canada and Alaska, which even at the time of the Cretaceous got quite cold in the winters, most likely may have had some sort of at least seasonal feather coating to keep warm. So one of the big things with these dinosaurs is they are pretty iconic to the Cretaceous. They did exist in the Jurassic, but those ones would have been a lot more like Psittacosaurus, very small, not a lot of stuff on the head, and actually bipedal in a lot of ways. And at least obligate bipeds, if not some semi-quadrupedal, semi-bipedal. But they're most known from the Cretaceous, which was the last age of the dinosaurs and the longest. It went from 145 million years ago to just around 66, 65 million years ago. And that's a date that a lot of people are passingly familiar with. It's when a big old asteroid hit uh, the Yucatan Peninsula and caused a big ecological, uh, what we call in the scientific community, kerfuffle, uh, which led to a big mass extinction. Ceratopsians, though, existed 161 million years ago, and that would be these little primitive ones. That is the most recent large mass extinction. There was always smaller yeah. extinction events, but it's and then now we're there's the large the extinctions, number. and then there's the smaller extinctions, which yeah. there's too many of those to count, because those are often just very regional. Yeah. 
So a big thing with Ceratopsians. So they are a North American and Asiatic type of dinosaur. At that time, those two continents had a lot of similarities in their wildlife and ecologies. Uh, the other thing is they're pretty famous dinosaurs. I'm pretty sure everyone who was a kid who had a dinosaur book, there was one splash page of a bunch of these types of dinosaurs all next to each other. And they are often compared to rhinos or cows or other large herbivores around today. Uh, despite the fact that at the time of the dinosaurs, there were no living species of grass. Grass evolved after the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. So these actually were not grazing animals, but browsing animals. Sort of like rhinos today. So that one is actually a relatively apt comparison. Um, and the other thing is the fact that they are pretty iconic looking. There's nothing entirely like them today. Nothing beaked and horned, really. Which is why I think they tend to stick in people's minds. So two things, uh, just questions, is why all the different frills and horns? So an animal that I often like to compare Ceratopsians to as a group are antelope. Antelope today have numerous different horn configurations and colorations and body sizes. And they all live in similar habitats to each other. Some of them cohabitate, actually many. And that's actually something very similar for the Ceratopsian dinosaurs. You would actually find stuff like Ineosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus around the same time in the same area. Which is one of the things that I think they had these different frills and horn setups and probably coloration as well, potentially as a way to tell the different species apart themselves. You want to make sure you're with the right herd of animals. You don't want to you know, get to the mating season, do all that display, all those, you know, fights with other males, then look over at the herd and you, you know, let's say you're a packy rhinosaurus and you look over, see the big hook horn on the nose, just go, oh, I just wasted my time. <laughs> but that is a really solid hypothesis as to why they had this broad range of horns and frills for the large ones. But then the other question is, why the frills at all? The frills are the most universal bit of anatomy other than the beak. Um, and there are a few different hypotheses, some that have fallen in and out of favor. One that fell out of favor just within my lifetime was that the frills were used to protect the back of their necks from bites. Uh, because, yes, they when they looked up, those would go right over the, the back of the neck. But one of the things when people have examined uh, these frills structurally is a lot of them have holes in the bone of the frill if you're looking at them dead on. Uh, Nasutoceratops is one of those, and Triceratops, as they got older, actually had less and less solid frill in the center as they got larger. So those frills actually weren't that durable. They were relatively easily damaged. They wouldn't stop the bite from, say, a Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, the leading hypothesis is they were a display organ, much like the dewlaps on iguanas, those big flaps of skin on their neck. These frills were likely brightly colored so that during mating season, you know, it would make the males look a little bit nicer, look a little bit more interesting. Or as a herd, you have a bunch of these all facing one direction at once and you're a predator, it's kind of a scary thing suddenly when you got like, let's say, well, let's say like a frill like that, a bunch of those facing you, it kind of breaks up the silhouette of the dinosaurs and it's hard to pick out an individual one. So they might have still been a defensive adaptation, but not in the way people thought. And the horns were definitely probably some sort of species identification and differentiation rather than a direct defense in most cases. While some of them, like Nasutoceratops and Triceratops, did have relatively prominent forward-facing horns, you have stuff like Pachyrhinosaurus, who's got a big flat, just boss on the, you know, on the nose. That's not really going to be doing that much if you just bump somebody. And Ineosaurus can't really, if it tilts its head down, you get the blunt end of the of the hook. So they probably weren't a direct aggressive fighting adaptation, at least with predators. They may have been used though against each other. We do occasionally find of a ceratopsian we didn't draw today, Styracosaurus, who did have a very long nose horn. We'll occasionally actually find injuries on Styracosaurus fossils, where it's very clearly like, oh, that nose horn fits perfectly into that like wound in like the shoulder blade. So they may have actually been using this for interspecies, or intraspecies, I think. Uh, violence. But they're kind of one of my favorite groups of dinosaurs just for how weird they could look. There's 
dozens of species of these all over North America and Asia, and they, again, they're relatively iconic. Everyone's seen at least one of these. Um, there's a museum around where I was when I was a kid, the Academy of Sciences. They had a big Triceratops skull, and it was on a wall facing out, and I remember as a little kid, it was massive. And Triceratops is one of the larger ceratopsians, getting close to about 20,000 pounds in weight, which um, is kind of, James and I were talking earlier, it's kind of a hard weight to conceptualize in your head, because the only things you can picture that are like in that realm of weight are really large vehicles and stuff like tanks or trucks. Uh, but another thing about ceratopsians is they have enlightened a lot of uh, our information on how dinosaurs matured as they grew. So I mentioned that Triceratops frills were not the same structurally all the way through their lives. There was at one point recognized a species of dinosaur called Taurosaurus, who had two big horns up on, above the eyes and one on the nose, a little one, much like Triceratops. And some paleontologists decided to examine the inside of the bones because recently we learned about birds is the inside of their bones, the the shape in there, the honeycomb structure changes as they grow, as they get to an adult. It gets a little bit denser. And they wanted to test something with how dinosaurs grew. And it's something that most museums won't do, is they won't let you take a sawzall to their nice, you know, T-Rex or Ceratopsian dinosaur femur and cut it in half and look in the cross section. But they were able to convince a few museums to do this. And they used Taurosaurus and Triceratops, thinking, these are two big Ceratopsian dinosaurs, that's going to be great to have those as a comparison. What they learned is the ones we were calling Triceratops were very clearly younger animals. And the ones we were calling Taurosaurus were almost entirely older animals, pretty much, for the, with that denser honeycomb structure. And then they started looking at the skull morphology. We have a lot of skulls of these animals because their skulls are a big hefty, thick piece of bone, essentially. They preserve really well. And they realized they were able to line up about, like, half a dozen of these skulls where they knew this is Triceratops, this is what we call Taurosaurus, this is what we know is a baby Triceratops, but then lined up a lot of stuff in between and realized they match up as a growth cycle pretty much perfectly. So these things actually show us that dinosaurs like birds, can look radically different when they're young compared to when they're fully grown. And it's actually something that has also affected tyrannosaurs. We realized tyrannosaurs looked really different when they were younger versus fully grown. But it's something that we can now apply to other dinosaurs, and we wouldn't know unless a couple of scientists really, really did a good job convincing the Smithsonian that, uh, hey, let us chop open these immaculate fossils. Um, James, do you have anything else you want to add? You you mentioned you saw something about the frills. Uh, something about the frills? I don't remember. Uh, something about what what they might have been used for. We were talking about that and we got cut off. We were drawing this. I can't remember. Ooh. I just thought that it was interesting how the Nasuda Seropops, um, how similar it looks to like an ox or like a, a, a horse or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then they like, when you were mentioning um, like a rhino, um, it, uh, it, it's sort of interesting to think about how, with even a completely different um, branches of the animal tree. Yeah, it's like, you know, lizards on one side or whatever, birds or whatever you want to say. Little well, dinosaurs on one branch and mammals on the other. Yeah. How similar dinosaurs and mammals actually wound up being. Uh, there's often a thing in paleo where people really try not to make dinosaurs look too mammalian. Yeah. In a lot of cases, I, I think that's kind of a silly thing to do because, in a lot of ways, mammals are very, very similar to dinosaurs. We fill a lot of the same ecological niches that were around back then that are still around today. Right. Large browsing herbivores, you're never not going to have those so long as there's trees. And if you have those, they'll all probably look kind of similar. There's going to be a similar body plan that yeah. tends to work, like big, quadrupedal, something on the front end. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And heavy, because, yeah. you know, rhinos aren't small. Um, neither were these guys. But I do like that these dinosaurs also show that even in the family with these large dinosaurs like Triceratops, there are still these little guys, like Psittacosaurus, who is about, the, about three feet long, you know, length of my leg, <laughs> running around. And small dinosaurs tend not to preserve well. Fossilization is not, as a lot of people call it, an unbiased process. 
like I said, being big, made of a lot of bone, and having something especially large and bony means you're going to fossilize a lot better because that is a lot more durable than the little Sitakasaurus right there. He's, he's tiny and fragile. He's got little hollow bones. Those things get crushed really easy, whereas these guys get buried under mud and stuff. But yeah, no, it... I, I honestly think they're one of the most fascinating families of dinosaurs. Um, I, I love these things. Uh, but we're going to try to do a couple more groups of dinosaurs in the live streams going forward. Hopefully I'll have a little bit more table covering in that. But other than that, just want to remind you again of the prehistoric painting night, 29th. Uh, we will flash up the poster one more time. And hopefully you guys will see the surprise dinosaur this month. And if it does well, it'll 